Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. So far, we've had a series called The Ancient Secrets in which I've gone over classic occult and Rosicrucian teachings on very interesting subjects like the Law of Assumption and the Law of Cycles. And today we're going to explore how to consult the Akashic Records as it's been written by a number of Rosicrucians. This is important. As I explained in previous episodes, the Rosicrucians collected a vast amount of information over many centuries and through practical application have been able to come up with a synthesis of these classical ideas on elevating the consciousness and developing your psychic powers. There is a discussion of how to consult the Akashic Records. And so I wanted to explore these teachings. And in fact, they use it to prophecy, to predict future events. Their explanation of the Akashic is just a little bit different. It's not a place or a thing. It is everything. It is the light in everything. Portions of this come from the book, The Complete Guide to Oracle and Prophecy Methods by Joseph J. Weed. How to Consult the Akashic Records The Akasha, or astral light, is actually the basis of all manifested existence. It is that matrix out of which all that is, is born by the process of separation and differentiation. In this astral light is imprinted or recorded all that has already taken place, plus certain fluid destinies due to become realities in the future. The human etheric body is sensitive to the ripples in the astral light and can In this manner, read the records imprinted in the Akashic. It should be pointed out here that the human energy body, which we have called the etheric body or double, is not made up of what scientists have referred to as the ether or plasma. The ether of science is the conducting medium presumed to act in the transmission of radio and television waves, magnetic impulses, and similar physical phenomena. This scientific ether is more rarefied than the observed physical world, but considerably less so than the double. Our etheric bodies move with ease in this conducting medium, but are of such a high vibratory essence that they can also maintain an awareness on the level of the astral light when trained to do so. The exercises which follow should make it possible for you to establish a basic awareness of the etheric body's contacts. These will at first be made much in the same vague manner that a small infant registers light and darkness, pleasure and pain, etc. Once you've attained this preliminary stage, you are then ready for additional instruction. Every human being is possessed of seven senses, five we are well aware of, and it is through seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling that we measure the physical world about us but we have two other senses which have not yet developed or it might be truer to say have not yet been redeveloped and for most humans they will not be active for many lives to come but these are certain ones today who can partially develop the next higher sense the sixth by intelligent persistence you may be such a person and the best way to find out is to try. When successful, this effort will lead you first to a conscious awareness of the double, and when that has been achieved, enable you to direct your attention to the Akashic Records. Awakening the Sixth Sense Your soul, or higher self, is fully aware of every thought and every experience that is recorded in your brain. But your brain and this means your waking awareness finds it extremely difficult to register the tenuous touches from the higher vibratory levels. The need, therefore, is to create a bridge, a transformer, which will make it possible for you to become aware of at least the next higher level, which is that of the etheric body or double. The mechanics of establishing a two-way awareness with your double have already been defined, but for the sake of clarity, this will be repeated here. In brief, 
and then further instructions given. Two methods have already been described. These are one, the process of gradually developing a conscious contact with your double by turning your attention to it several times a day over a period of several months. This, as you have learned, is done by focusing your attention on each portion of your physical body, in turn starting with your toes and proceeding on upward to the top of your head. This interest in the physical creates a corresponding flow of mental energy to all portions of the etheric, which when repeated often results in complete awareness on the etheric or energy level. This method gives the most consistent and reliable effects. 2. The second approach described is the recall of dream experiences. This technique involves self-suggestion. Upon retiring, tell yourself aloud to remember on awakening what you dreamed about and then ask what you be shown or given the desired information in your dreams. This will be found to work better if you make a regular practice of writing down all your dreams upon awakening. A word should be inserted here about waking up dreams. There are roughly two levels of dreaming, deep sleep dreams and the dreams you experience while in the process of waking up. Deep sleep dreams are hard to remember, but they are the most significant. Usually, they are completely reasonable and frequently they will convey priceless guidance. The waking up dreams are mostly superficial and result from physical stimuli of one type or another noises, changes in temperature, discomfort, etc. Often, a waking up dream will appear to involve travel. This is merely a recognition by the consciousness of its changing from a higher level back to the physical. A new exercise. A third method is here described to awaken certain psychic centers and develop a harmonious relationship between them. As with the previous two, this method also requires that you make a positive effort to achieve the result desired. Experience with many students has shown that their successful development will usually in direct proportion to the time and energy devoted to the training exercises. This next exercise is new. Here's what you are to do. Three, there are two mantras. If you're not already doing so, by all means, start to practice these mantras daily this will help to build the necessary foundations for the subsequent training. The first sound I give you is dual in nature. In fact, it is actually two sounds. The first Ra represents the sun and the powers of the day. And the second Ma represents the moon and the powers of the night. Intone the two together as Ra Ma. And after you have caught the tone, I want you to repeat it. Then, after several days, you can start to intone Tho five times, immediately following your intonation of Ra Ma. The two sounds together will decidedly lift your vibratory nature and greatly stimulate your subtle body. Practice for 30 days before going on to the next step, the silver cord. In this course of training, for that is exactly what this is all about, I try to explain the reason for each exercise in order that you may understand the one to follow. I must first describe for you the life energy we all use. You surely are familiar with what has been called the silver cord of the soul. This is the energy link which connects the source of all human energy, the great oversoul, with each individual human being. It can be seen by those with psychic sight as a rope of light which appears to divide as it nears the body. One strand goes to the center of the back between the shoulder blades, which is the location of the heart center. Through this strand flows the energy which maintains life in the individual. When it is severed or withdrawn, the person dies. The other strand enters the body at the top of the head and is connected there with what is called the higher head center. This is the consciousness strand and because of its stimulus we humans have developed first an awareness of the world about us, and then millennia later an awareness of ourselves or self-consciousness. The next unfolding is that of soul consciousness, and it is toward the most desirable goal that we all should strive. Right now, the best step forward on this path, and a most important step, is the creation of a bridge to the double. This is the objective for which the exercises are designed. 
The psychic strand that enters the head is connected there with a vibrating psychic center which is associated with the pineal gland. This gland is in the very middle of your head. The awareness and memory centers which you use daily are located in the head but are not normally in contact with the higher head center. This is not a question of location but of vibratory level. One of them is at the back of the head above where the spinal column enters the cranium and the other is in the front part of the head between the eyes about one inch back of the root of the nose. It is this latter center which has been recently written about as the third eye and various strange recommendations given to affect its opening. One of the worst and most ridiculous is that which suggests an actual physical opening in the cranium be made by boring or burning a hole in the forehead. This could and probably would be fatal. The idea stems from a misunderstanding of certain scars or livid marks seen on the foreheads of Tibetan monks. They like Hindu caste marks but are actual lesions and are not painted or pasted on. They correspond in the Eastern world to the stigmata seen occasionally in Christian countries and are presumably self-induced. Awakening the Third Eye The actual awakening of the third eye may be accomplished by the method I will now describe. This exercise is designed to establish a rapport or attunement between the center back of the forehead in the neighborhood of the pituitary gland and that in the middle of the head. So after you've begun to establish a resonance between the two centers by intoning the mantra, Rama Tho, proceed with the following exercise, which is in three steps. 4. A. Breathe in to a measured account of 10. As you inhale, concentrate on the center between the eyes until you can almost feel it. At the same time, visualize it glowing with a golden light. This should not be the dull sheen of metallic gold, but more like the brilliance of golden sunshine. Next, hold your breath in for the count of 20, and at the same time, concentrate on the center in the middle of your head. Visualize it surrounded by an aura of brilliant white light. Now breathe out in the same cadence to the count of 12. As you do, visualize the white light blending with the golden light to form a huge aureola of golden white light about your head. Repeat this exercise three times at each daily sitting for 30 days and five times at each sitting thereafter. This exercise is basic. When performed daily and accompanied by the mantra Rama and Tho described it should bring noticeable results in four to six months. As you are probably aware, it is designed to create a resonance between the two major head centers. Then, when one is stirred in any way, the other will also vibrate in the same measure. And when just such an attunement is achieved, you will become aware of all impacts upon the etheric body, your double, just as you now recognize all the stimuli that stir your physical senses. Then, through this newly found awareness equipment, you can learn how to make conscious contact with the Akashic Records. As you proceed with your training, there will come a time when a fragile contact is made with your double and you become dimly aware of a world beyond your five physical senses. This will at first be shadowy and vague. Your best efforts to bring clarity and definition will be more apt to break the contact then improve it. This might be likened to the function of peripheral vision versus direct vision. Your eyes will see a great deal more than what you may focus them upon. To prove this, go out of doors and look into the distance. After a moment, relax your attention without changing the direction of your gaze. You will then observe you can detect motion at right angles to your line of vision simultaneously on both sides of your head. Thus your field of vision is now greatly enlarged, but nowhere in focus. You can observe motion, changes in light, and so on, but no details. The very instant you turn your attention to a specific spot to get a closer look, your sight will once again narrow down to its normal field of focus. First, etheric contacts. Your first contacts with your etheric body's equipment will bring a somewhat similar experience. Your earliest impressions will depend upon your own background and line of development. They may be auditory or visual. 
or even may appear through one of the other senses. When I first worked at this development, the sense which initially manifested was olfactory. At the time, I didn't realize what was taking place, although I noticed that nearly everyone I encountered had a distinct odor, some pleasant and others not so. I didn't give this much thought, not nearly what I should have, and merely dismissed the experiences with the superficial appraisal that some people bathed often while others did not. But one day, I was jolted into a realization of what I was experiencing. A fine-looking, well-groomed man was shown into my office, and immediately on his entry, I caught a very strong and somewhat disgusting smell of Ophal. Since the man appeared quite clean, it suddenly dawned upon me that this was the functioning of the olfactory sense of etheric body, and not my physical nose. Knowing something of the significance of etheric odors, I was immediately put on guard and got rid of him as quickly as possible. After he had gone, I asked my secretary if he had noticed anything unusual about my visitor, but she had not. I later checked with the girl in the reception room where she had been seated for several minutes. She had been favorably impressed by him and had detected nothing out of the ordinary. Then I later learned I had been well advised to give no credence to the plausible and attractive business proposition he offered. In talking with one of my competitors, he told me he had financed the idea and had subsequently lost several thousand dollars. After that initial realization, I paid more attention to these impressions by encouraging them and consciously broadening my contact. I gradually brought other etheric senses into focus. I use the word broadening here as the most descriptive word I can find for the process involved, but it is not exact. Should your first contacts come visually or audibly, you may not find it necessary to reach out for other sense impressions. You may instead prefer to concentrate upon the channel, which is opened and through which you are obtaining desired information and leave the others to develop gradually in the future as you continue your exercises. My experience with the strange odor should indicate to you that the senses of your double will put you in touch with many facets of existence of which you are presently unaware. These will tend to capture and in some cases hold your interest. If you permit this to happen, you will find it most difficult to make contact with the Akashic Records. These new experiences may so intrigue you that you will seek no further. But if you desire to forecast the future, you must continue to work towards that objective. How to contact the Akashic Records Here then is the way in which you should proceed. When you eventually find yourself aware of the etheric senses then begin to turn your consciousness inward. Try to avoid being fascinated by the new and exciting impressions you are receiving. Remember, you have a sixth sense, which can even now in this life be brought into partial activity by means of etheric awareness. So turn your attention to it. I can almost hear you say, how? The answer is by focusing your attention on the psychic center in your head, which is associated with the pineal gland. Here is the procedure. 1. Seek out a place where you will not be disturbed. The quieter it is, the better. Make yourself completely comfortable. Sit in an easy chair, and when you're relaxed, turn your attention inward and center it on the area of the pineal gland. See it glow with a golden white radiance and feel it pulsate with energy. As you do this, your realization of the sounds, colors, and temperature in the room around you should gradually fade, and as they do, so the subtle psychic stirrings will become more noticeable. 2. At first this may be only an impression of inner light, or of brilliantly illuminated geometrical figures, or stars shooting by in ordered procession, or some other visual appearance which will probably be meaningless, or your first impressions may be of sound great rushes of heavenly orchestral music, or the clear high tones of a perfect voice, or the blending of the most magnificent sounds of nature, the music of the spheres. But you're untrained here. It will come and go unpredictably. It will take time, and the trial and error of experience before you will be able to sift out and select what you want to see or to hear. 3. It may take you a month of daily effort to reach this point. 
or you may achieve a good working control in a week or two. When you find yourself able to point yourself to where you want to go, so to speak, it will then be possible to seek out contact with the Akashic Records themselves. 4. This contact is accomplished by an effort of the will working with the mind. You point the mind, so to speak, not to the Akashic for this would be too vague and objective, but to a specific point in the past. The past is recommended to start because it is already solidly recorded and you should encounter no vagueness if you are sure of your target. Let me give you an example. 5. Let us say you decide to find out more about the Battle of Bunker Hill. First you read up on it. This is so that you have a background of information which will make the scene you envision more understandable and it is also to set you yourself in the mood of the moment you seek to recreate. You may find yourself reliving a scene from the battle even as you are reading about it. But if this does not occur, by the time you have finished reading, put down the book and start to review in your mind what you read. 6. It is at this point that you literally ask yourself, what happened that afternoon? If you have properly prepared yourself, you will find yourself drifting into a scenario-like dream. This is actually your contact, so don't brush it aside. All too frequently, a student will suspect he is imagining things or that he is dreaming and will rouse himself to start over. This is a mistake. In the earlier stages of your development, you will not get clearly defined contacts that you can recognize as such, so don't expect them. Accept the dreamlike sequence which passes before your consciousness as you sit in reverie. Remember what you observe. Write it down as soon as possible thereafter. 7. These first contacts should be regarded as practice sessions. You must literally feel your way into the creation of a solid connection between your brain, your waking awareness, and the Akasha. When this has been accomplished, and you can recall an instant from the past as simply as you can look up an account in the encyclopedia, you are then ready to move on to forecasting the future. The future is not very well understood. In fact, there is considerable confusion and controversy about it. Some allege it is entirely fixed and cannot be changed, that our fate is born with us so there is no point in struggling against it. Others maintain the future is unformed and is being created minute by minute. These latter state that we hold all of the future in our hands to do with it as we will. We maintain that both viewpoints are partly true and partly mistaken. Let me explain. For human beings, there must always be a percentage of uncertainty about the future. True in some cases, this element of doubt may be only one part in a hundred million, or even as remote as one part in a billion. But as far as it is possible for us to comprehend life and the world in which we live, there will be an aspect of indefiniteness to the future. But some things are pretty well fixed. The sun rises and sets on schedule. The seasons change, and the stars hold to their courses. It seems as if the only areas of uncertainty lie in the fields which may be influenced by human decision and action, where our free will may be employed. This, in a general way, is true, but is less than completely accurate. The fact is that all future incidents, events, and happenings involve at least a partial degree of uncertainty. This may range from 50% where a personal decision to sit down or stand up is concerned on up through an infinite range to where the uncertainty factor is less than one in a billion. From this you can begin to realize your prophecy functions. Because of causes generated in the present or past, there are many future occurrences already well established. For example, you may be engaged to be married and have set a wedding date. Thus, there is already the probability, a good probability, of children in your future. Remember, though, that nothing in the future is 100% certain. Nothing. Now, you may wonder how it's possible for you or anyone to see into the future. The answer is by contacting the Akashic Records and observing there what is already set up to occur in the future. For some events, the space is already cemented, as they say. And for these, an accurate forecast can be made. Others are not so definitely set and may change not 
only once but many times before final manifestation. Where undeveloped humans are concerned, which is to say about half of all people presently alive, a fairly accurate forecast can be made of their entire lives, even when they are quite young. This is because they tend to follow the pattern selected and to move only in the direction and to the extent that they are led or pushed. The more advanced people, those of greater intelligence, discrimination, and originality are much more difficult to predict because they repeatedly break out of their established patterns. There are the ones who have it in their power to alter the fate of the world. Their decisions now can bring about an era of stability for this planet or they can plunge us all into a holocaust. It is to be sincerely hoped that you who read this will still the competitive urges with which we are all born and substitute an attitude of understanding and calm goodwill to all men everywhere. First Akashic Contacts Nothing is simple. Everything in the physical world about you is exceedingly complex and as you move on into the subtle realms, the complexities increase. You must be prepared for this as you attempt contact with the Akashic Records. Most often this contact will present itself to your waking awareness in visual form accompanied by the more essential sounds. Occasionally though, it will be entirely auditory, as though someone were standing close behind you telling you what has taken place or will occur in the future. It must be remembered that regardless of whether this appears to you in visual or merely audible form, it actually is vibratory in nature, somewhat, like the impressions on a magnetic tape. The images you perceive or hear are all from your own mind and have been stirred into activity by the Akashic vibrations you have contacted. This accounts to some degree for the variations in the forecast of the same event by two different prophets. Each makes the same vibratory contact but realizes it according to the experiences in his own image storehouse. As has been pointed out, once you have developed a working connection between your brain and your etheric body, it is not too difficult to contact the Akashic records. But since these embrace in detail every event since this world began, and many events still to come, your first attempts are almost sure to result in confusion. For example, you are quite apt to register events that happened 200,000 years ago, 50 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and last week in such a rapid succession that they all overlap and appear as one undecipherable occurrence. So until you're able to discriminate and to willfully select the exact time and place, it is best to use the technique earlier suggested and tie in your search with the physical object connected with it. How a Lost Plane Was Discovered A good example of the need for this and its efficiency when provided is the recent discovery of a lost plane by a psychic. On March 13, 1970, a small plane took off from Pima, Arizona bound for Tucson and was never heard from again. One of the five occupants was a man named Barry Guerin. When all searches for the plane were finally called off on March 22nd, his wife sought out the well-known psychic Peter Herkos and his aide. Herkos, who was then in California, requested that articles of Guerin's clothing be brought to him. This is significant. Herkos, who has what is known as second sight, in other words, the capacity to use his double, needed the clothing of Garin in order to get a focus on him in the Akashic Records. After Mrs. Garin had brought the clothing to Herkos, he could see the lost plane, like a television picture in my mind, he said. Then he indicated on a map where he believed the plane to be and described the location as best he could. Armed with Peter Herkos's marked map and his description of the surroundings, the Graham County Sheriff's Office sent out a party of men on horses, and they found the plane and its five dead occupants on March 28, 1970. In previous writings, I have documented two other Akashic contacts which were described, one keyed to a bit of lava from Vesuvius, and the other in connection with a piece of painted plaster or stone from a ruin in Mexico. Both were psychometric in character, as was Peter Herko's locating of the lost plane. But psychometry is based upon Akashic contact, and only those can psychometrize who knowingly or unknowingly can establish such a contact. So to facilitate your Akashic contacts, it is best to start in with definite physical objects. Pick a pebble from a hillside, a piece of wood from an old piece of furniture, or a bit of gold, jewelry unfamiliar to you. Hold it in your hand, pressed against your breast, 
or against your forehead as you direct your consciousness to the Akasha. If you've been properly prepared, you will soon begin to get impressions, fleeting at first, but gradually becoming stronger as you become more proficient. Let me describe some experiences reported by others. They will help to indicate to you the approximate course your own experiments may follow. Reports on psychometric contacts with the Akasha. Report by AVBS. My great-grandfather had been decorated by Queen Victoria for gallant conduct in the British Army in India. In his effects, I came upon the medal in the form of a cross, which had been awarded him, and, becoming curious about the event, decided to try to make contact with it. I first prepared myself as instructed, then sat back in an easy chair and held the medal pressed against my forehead. As I directed my thoughts to the ceremony which had taken place so many years ago, I gradually drifted into the reverie which for me always precedes a successful contact. Suddenly I stood in a richly furnished room with a heavy red carpet on the floor and many mirrors on the walls. There were two men standing near a fireplace at the far end, a young woman sitting on a couch nearby. Two women were standing behind it, to one side and a man and two other women behind it to the other side. In the doorway as if entering were two men in uniform, one an older man of great dignity and the other a young man, a junior officer, which I knew to be my great-grandfather. The older officer preceded my ancestor into the room and going toward the couch, he stopped before it and bowed respectfully. Your Majesty, he said, may I have the honor to present Mr. Satherwaite. It was clear that this plump young girl was the queen. Her body was small and nicely formed, but her face was rather plain with prominent teeth and eyes that seemed to bulge a little. She smiled and said rather softly, I am happy to receive you, my lord, and I am honored to greet this young hero who has so courageously served his country. All this time, my great-grandfather, visibly impressed, was bowing very low. The older officer then made quite a lengthy speech about the distinguished bravery of my great-grandfather in fighting against the Afghans and how he had been responsible for saving many British lives. At its conclusion, the young queen spoke out in a tiny voice with what seemed a rather un-English accent. She had an odd way of nodding her head on certain words as if to give them emphasis, but she spoke kindly and asked my great-grandfather if he had fully recovered. I assumed from this he must have been wounded, but this was the first I had heard of it. There was general conversation to which a rather handsome man with prominent whiskers contributed some remarks in a heavy German accent. This I took to be Prince Albert. In a few moments the Queen rose, and I was surprised to see how small she was. She motioned for my great-grandfather to come stand before her, and as he did, one of the women handed her a blue velvet cushion on which reposed a medal. The Queen picked up the medal and then reached upward to pin it onto his jacket, saying as she did so, God bless you. As she turned then to resume her seat on the couch, the conversation broke out again. The older officer bowed low and said it was necessary for him to go. My great-grandfather did the same, and as they left the room, the scene faded, and I came to full consciousness back in the chair in my study. Report of ERP All my life, I've had a great interest in Egypt, ancient Egypt. I have never been there, but wished many times that I might go. My husband knows of my fascination with things Egyptian, so when a friend of his returned from a University of Pennsylvania archaeological project in Egypt, he sought him out. Knowing nothing about the problems of archaeological research in Egypt, he had a vague notion that he might bring back some small treasure from Egypt's past. His friend soon corrected this idea. He pointed out that all things found in Egypt belong to Egypt, if important enough they were placed in the museum. If not, they were sold by the Egyptian government. Inevitably, though, some small artifacts and trinkets found their way out of the country, and from his friend, my husband learned of a dealer in New York who had recently come into possession of some fragments of a necklace which had been found in a tomb. When the dealer displayed them, my husband was disappointed. They were four small bits of lapis lazuli set in gold and apparently a fragment from a necklace. Three were joined together, but the fourth was separate. The dealer wanted $2,000 for the four, but finally agreed to sell the separate stone for $300. So my husband bought it and proudly gave it to me for my birthday. This was the first genuine object from ancient Egypt I had ever held in my hands, and I was delighted. 
At the earliest opportunity, I sought to find out more about my treasure, who had owned it, and when they had lived. This is what I experienced. I appeared to wake up in a room with stone walls with two windows cut in the wall facing east. It was just down and the first streaks of light were lifting above the horizon visible from the window. I was lying nude on a low bed on short wooden legs. My only covering was a large skin of fur which lay over my thighs and legs. The air seemed warm but not hot. The room was about 15 feet square with stone walls on the east and north sides but with a sort of screen hanging separating the other two sides from what appeared to be an extension of the room. My bed was along the north wall. Near the screen on the south wall sat a large dog facing me. He sat there motionless with his eyes upon me, and I knew he was my dog, my guardian, and his name was Anu. It was soon quite light, although the sun had not yet risen. I rose and pushed aside the curtain on the west side of the room. Beyond was a room of about the same size in the center of which was a sunken tub about six feet square. The water was clear and warm as I went down two steps and allowed it to cover me. There were two women in the room and I knew them to be maids who were there to serve me. When I left the water I lay at the edge of the small pool while they dried me by rubbing scented oils into my skin. No towels were used. Meanwhile my dog Anu had accompanied me and sat to one side watching all that took place. When my skin was quite dry, one of the girls brought a pleated dress of very sheer linen and put it on over my head. It had a square collar and no sleeves and hung down to just above my knees. Then the other girl brought a metal belt and necklace of lapis lazuli and gold. It was quite large in front with many stones, but in the back there was just the gold wire. I then seated myself on a large solid block of marble about 20 inches square while the two maids arranged my hair. This turned out to be a lengthy and intricate process which took more than a half an hour. Finally they finished and one brought a large high head piece which she carefully placed on my head while the other girl brought sandals which she fastened to my feet. To my surprise, the tall head piece was quite light and I assumed it must have been made of thinly cut cedar which had designs painted on it. I was then fully dressed. Pushing aside the south curtain, I walked out to an open terrace, which appeared to be an extension of my apartment, and then down a flight of about six steps to another and much larger terrace. There stood a chariot drawn by two horses, which were held by a groom. I went to each horse and carefully examined the harness about his head and the connections with the chariot. Then I took the reins and stepped onto its tiny platform crowded there by my dog, Anu, who accompanied me. As I tightened the reins and the horses started to move, I came back to consciousness in my bedroom in New York. So I had my answer. This was not like other Akashic contacts I had made. This was not like a three-dimensional color movie in which I was a spectator. This was something that had happened to me. That piece of lapis lazuli had been a part of a necklace that had at one time been worn by me. And from the various details of the contact, it seems likely that I, at that time, was a noblewoman or princess in Egypt. The foregoing two reports describe the type of experience most likely to be yours after you awaken a conscious connection with your double and attempt your first Akashic contacts. These are both psychometrically induced, which means that the experimenters were aided in focusing on a definite image by trying it with a physical object, and both experiences were in the past. Practice in this way at the start then you have developed a confidence in your ability to make these contacts try one without using a physical magnet as you realize you must find a substitute an adequate substitute for the magnet this has to be a thoughtful a very strongly held visualization of the person or place or time you wish to contact this can be done in fact many people do it so you can too and when you succeed two or three times you are then ready to look into the future so practice in this way now, and more detailed instructions will be given to you later. So with our other episodes on the Akashic Record, and we have a couple, and I have a meditation on Akashic Jumping, this is giving us some new information which is important. If you want to make contact with the Akashic Record, you need to have contact with your subtle etheric body. You can do this through meditation and through mantra. 
and through a variety of different exercises. But what is fascinating is that when you are attuned to the etheric body, your senses are different. The etheric body can see things that are not there in the regular body and it can smell things. And I have experienced this that is discussed in this chapter. You meet somebody, they might have just got out of the shower and they have normal cologne on. You think they're smelling good, right? But then you smell something that doesn't make sense. And then to understand that it's sort of a psychic impression and people give us etheric odors and there are etheric sounds. And the more you tune into this body, that body is what tunes into the Akashic record. I think that that's the key fundamental role. This involves an awakening the third eye, a connection to that energy center and the subtle vibrational field around you. So remember that our goal is to awaken that second etheric body that makes up the Akashic light that allows us to attach and connect to the Akashic field. You will get impressions, start writing down the impressions that you get. You get them in dreams and it's incredibly interesting because you can go back and analyze any place in history and time. And then the second technique is by using psychometry, which we have a couple episodes on as well. You can touch objects and when your etheric body is connected to and you're tuned into that subtle body, when you touch objects, you can have experiences and memories that are related to that object. This is one of my favorite ways to connect to the Akashic record. It's one of the reasons I love going to used bookstores and grabbing the book and feeling the memories of the people reading it. I can find out so much information. The discussion of the silver cord is also very interesting. I've always thought the silver cord seemed to be related to the plat, but it's connected between the shoulder blades. And that's an important thing to understand that connects you to the great oversoul, it says. And that particular strand is tuning in to that psychic center and is a part of this process. Let me know your favorite part of this, or if you connect to the Akashic record, how do you go about doing it? Have you connected to your etheric body? Please share your comments, share your knowledge and information and experiences, because that's the only way we can really learn is by learning together and sharing our own unique experiences. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.